Welcome to the video. In this one, I am going to run through the six things that I wish I knew when I first started doing obstacle course racing. If you're new to OCR and thinking of giving it a go, or if you've already done one or two races and are looking to step up your performance, hopefully you'll find all this useful. Just quickly, in case you're thinking, why listen to this guy? Who the hell are you? That is a great question. I'm not an expert or a coach or a trainer. I'm not even all that good. But here's what I am. I am somebody that can remember vividly, because it wasn't that long ago, the things that I encountered when I began that left me thinking, I wish I'd known that before. Now, having said I'm no good, let me just establish some small degree of credibility. My obstacle course racing history is this. I did my first one in early 2019. I came into it from a casual running background, mostly doing five and 10 Ks, which I'd been doing for a few years by that point in order to lose weight. I had previously been gigantically heavy. That is a whole other video. I'll link it up the top. You can go and watch that horror story if you want to. And despite some initial hurdles, which hopefully this video will help you avoid, I fell in love with the sport immediately. So during 2019, I did lots and lots. I started off very badly and I finished the year being slightly above average. Most of my races were Spartan events, but I also did some nuclear and nuts races. They're both big UK events. I did lots of smaller ones. I even did the OCR World Championships. I went into 2020 with an expectation that I was gonna build on my good 2019, had dozens of events booked, and of course, along comes COVID, and after a couple that I got done in January and February, it was game over. Which brings me to now. Next month, June, six or seven weeks away, I will be running my first proper OCR in over a year. I'm at Spartan Wales doing the trifecta, so that's the long distance event on the Saturday, the medium distance event on the Sunday morning, and then the sprint event on the Sunday afternoon. So I am currently very, very focused on that. And it occurred to me that my thoughts on the priorities for my training now are very different to what I thought I should be focusing on back in 2019 before I'd actually run any. So here are the six things that I think it's worth a beginner knowing so that you can direct time and energy into the right things. Grip strength. Whenever I see somebody ask online for advice on their very first OCR, grip strength is one of the first things to be mentioned. And people advising stuff like chin-ups or pull-ups. And it's easy to see why. When you look at a highlight video footage of a race, it's monkey bars, it's rope climbing, it's heavy carries. But grip strength, in the way it's often advised you improve it, seems to miss a few key points. Now, first of all, the grip-based events and the carries are a very, very small part of an obstacle course race. I wish they weren't. I wish that heavy carries were a kilometer long because as someone that is six foot six and 230 pounds, they suit me. But the reality is that most of what you're gonna be doing is running, not gripping. So it's not the most vital aspect of a race, but how should you train for it? Well, here's the first thing. Being able to do pull-ups, chin-ups, does not translate to obstacles that you need to hang on or things you need to carry. I can do pull-ups just fine, but on my very, very first Spartan event, one of the first obstacles was the monkey bars. I ran across a field and I saw the monkey bars up ahead of me and I thought, well, this is gonna be easy. The last time I played on monkey bars, I had no problems at all. I grabbed hold of the first bar, I swung out to the second one, I fell on the floor. It seems monkey bars had got harder than when I was eight years old. So gripping things to hang on to something or to carry something is not a lats exercise for your back. It's not a pull-up. There's more about your hand's tolerance for holding on. And on the hanging events in particular, holding on, letting go, and then grabbing again. When you use something like the monkey bars, the skill you need is to be able to hold yourself momentarily with one arm while you swing to the next one and grab it confidently without fatigue in your hands and your forearms building up. You don't need to be able to bang out chin up after chin up. How I train for that is on the pull up bar in the gym by grabbing, releasing and grabbing again in a different position over and over and over. Getting my hands used to that, the, the impact of grabbing a bar fast and quick. You do not want to reach for a grip on an obstacle course race and slip and miss it. And not just a regular gym bar, because you won't always have a nice easy grip bar on a run. I go to the park and I use the bar on the swing set down there. And in the garage here, I have a selection of climbing grips. In fact, let me show you. 
So I use all of these different shaped grips to get my hands used to grabbing onto and holding something irrespective of the shape it might be. I don't want to get to an obstacle course race and find that the grip is something I'm not experienced or used to holding. Uh, I want to just better grab anything within reason. And talking of climbing grips, I took up indoor climbing because that is excellent. It perfectly mimics some of the obstacles that you'll find. Having said, it's not a pull up exercise. The one thing I do practice is a sort of half rep movement. There will be times when you are struggling to get to the next grip along. And if you are at full extension with your arms, it is physically impossible to complete that movement unless one of your arms is oddly longer than the other. So you will need to sort of half pull yourself up so you can grab to the next rung. I train that by doing my hanging leg raises, which I already do a couple of times a week in the gym anyway, with a, a bent arm position. As simple as that. Skills. Skills are awesome because once you learn them, you leapfrog other people with minimal effort. Now, not every event has the same obstacles. And if you're doing a one-off race and it has some wacky thing they have you do, it may well be that is not a skill worth learning. But there are things that crop up often. At Spartan races in particular, the three that I'm gonna go over are the rope climb, the spear throw, and the rope traverse. These are things that done right can be over in seconds and should take very little effort. Done wrong and you are either exhausting yourself unnecessarily or even worse, doing a penalty for failing an obstacle. So the rope climb. If you've ever watched crossfitters going up a rope, arms only, forget that nonsense. Do not climb a rope like that unless you were raised in the circus. The secret to a rope climb is locking your feet off with a J-hook or an S-hook, and that's it. There is no upper body strength required beyond holding onto the rope to not fall off, obviously. Check out online tutorials. Spartan do some great ones themselves. Once you can lock your feet, it is as simple as standing up. You adjust your grip, raise your legs back up the rope, lock them off again, and stand up again. Repeat until you get to the top. I bought myself a rope on eBay. I tied it to the ceiling in the garage here, and I just practiced doing the J-hook over and over until I could do it without looking, didn't need to look at where my feet were, where the rope was. They just found the rope and locked off. The rope climb went from being a draining upper body exercise to being something that I now, I look forward to it. It's an opportunity to basically have a break from running. And I'm one of the heavier people doing OCR. It doesn't matter. I've arrived at a rope climb, seen people struggling on the rope, done mine, left, and the same people still struggling. I feel like just shouting back at them, guys, go and watch a J-hook tutorial. It should not be that hard. The spear throw. This one's quite particular to Spartan, but if you are running a Spartan, you do not want to miss the spear throw, especially if you're running the beast long distance event, because it happens twice. Now, if you do it right, that is about 10 seconds of effort. You do it wrong, that's a lot of burpees. I missed all my spear throws in my first few races, and it dawned on me that I was just going to keep missing them until I practiced enough. But the only time I practiced was the one throw during the race. If you race a lot, that might mean you still only get 10, 11, 12 throws a year. You don't get good at a skill like that by doing 12 reps a year. So I built my own spear. I took a standard broom handle, put a bolt in the end for weight, put a dog toy on the tip for safety, and then out in the garden, I threw that thing hundreds of times. I found a technique that I liked, a stance that felt good, and then when I got to events, I would just mimic what I did in the garden. And I can't remember the last time I missed a spear throw now. I'm sure it will happen at some point, but it'll be because of just bad luck. It will not be because I was ill-prepared. And the rope traverse. I only discovered this one on the last race I did of 2019. On the race before, I'd come upon the rope traverse in a bad way. I was exhausted and I struggled with it massively. I had cramp in my legs from trying to lock them over onto the rope and hook on. My arms were wasted, it was horrendous. I put the video up, it's grim. I got to the bell, but man, it was not pretty. And the cramp that it caused meant that when I got off the rope, the last few obstacles were absolute hell. But while I'd been slowly killing myself hanging underneath the thing, I'd watch other guys go over the top of the rope, not Navy SEAL style. So the next event I did, I gave it a try, and it just sums up this category of learning skills, because it went from something horrific, painful, exhausting, to being something that is easy to do. It gives me a rest. Literally, I am lying down. It's an opportunity for a breather. I went across that rope last time 
laughing to myself that I had been doing it so stupidly the previous time, and obviously laughing at the people still hanging upside down on their ropes beside me. So in summary, if you're doing an event and you see somebody else whiz through a particular obstacle and you're struggling with that, and there's no obvious reason why they don't appear to be fitter or stronger than you, then watch what they're doing. They may have just acquired the skill. Go home, learn it yourself. Running. Okay, this is the big one, running. An OCR is a run with a few things in the way. If you can't run, it will hamper you more than anything else. My very first Spartan was a 5K event. That's their sprint event. At that time, I was doing park runs every weekend, 5K. So I went into it pretty confident. And when I crossed the finish line, exhausted over an hour later, I checked my Garmin and I was gonna go and launch a complaint that the course had obviously been 10 or 15K, not five, and my watch said 4.9. The combination of obstacles, having to stop and start, and the terrain they will send you over means that 5K will feel like 10, and 10 will feel like a half marathon, and a 20K race, so like a Spartan Beast event, I find that as physically taxing as if I'm running an actual marathon. Now that does not mean you have to be an amazing runner, especially if you're going into the open heats and you're not taking it competitively seriously. There will always be plenty of people that are just walking around. I did an event last year, actually a COVID friendly one. I did it with my wife and my kid and we walked a lot of it. So my point is not that you need to become an elite runner. My point is if you're gonna direct time, focus and effort into training, put it into what you're gonna spend most time doing. And those distances I mentioned, that's what I use to plan. If I've got a 10K event coming up, my week's going up to that, my running plan will look like the sort of training I'd have for a 20K run, a half marathon. My training for the three Welsh events that are coming up looks pretty similar to regular marathon training. And like anything, train with a mind on how you'll race. If you run pavement all the time when you're training, it means you're gonna have quite a shock on your legs when you are exhausted and you get sent down a really steep hill covered in logs, covered in mud, even worse, going up that hill. So get off road and train. It's not just your running fitness you need to work on, it's your ability to move around natural obstacles, to catch yourself if you slip. Basically be confident off road. It's a different thing to road running. I now love off road running. In fact, 80, 90% of the non-obstacle course races that I do now are off road events. And I've beaten people on those trail races that were far, far better runners than me, but just not as confident flying through woodland or down steep descents over ditches through streams. So just run, run off road and get some distance in beyond the length of the event you're gonna enter. The right category. Now I'm mindful here, especially of having just spoken about the importance of running, that I don't create the impression that you have to race, that it matters what time you get, that it matters what place you get, if it doesn't matter to you. Of course it doesn't. Anybody doing an OCR from the person that wins to the person that comes last is doing vastly more than the average human being who is a physical mess. So if you want to walk it or jog walk or jog slow, do that and enjoy it. However, if there is any part of you that is thinking, I'm quite competitive, I'd like to take this quite seriously, I strongly recommend running in the right category. Now, not every event has separate categories. Some, you simply run, you race, and you see where you come. But some, Spartan, for example, break it down into three groups. They have elite runners. If you're an elite runner and you're watching this, stick it down in the comments because that will be rather amusing. They then have open runners for everybody. It is timed and you do get a finished position, but it's a different atmosphere. No one is going to criticize people for helping each other. If you can't do an obstacle, you can skip it. I think it's fair to say nobody is too fussed if you don't complete your penalties for skipping those obstacles. If you just want to go along and have fun, it is absolutely perfect. As I said, I've run events like that with my wife and kid where we go along and we just run open, we have a great day out. But between elite and open is age group. There you're racing against people that are your age competitively. That means you are not getting help. You are doing the obstacles or you're facing the penalties. I have never run a Spartan outside of age group. The very first one I did, I asked a couple of forums online and 99% of people said, run open and see how you go. 1% of people said, what do you got to lose? Go for it, at least you'll know where you stack up legitimately against people sticking to the same rules as you. So I ran age group. I came last or almost last. I kind of forget, it was certainly very close to last. 
and I was hooked. I went home, I looked online, there was a list of names that ran the event, mine was on there, right down near the bottom, but that was it, I was a competitive athlete. Again, this advice is not for everyone. If you want to simply enjoy your day, smile when you see the photographer snapping away and wait for your friend who is lagging behind, basically just be a nice, pleasant human being looking to stay in shape. Open runs are brilliant, but if you want to compete, no matter whether you're good enough or not, if your concern when you see the photographer is they do not get in your bloody way and you will trample your friend just to get ahead of them, age group, competitive heats, of the six tips, this is the only one I've got right from the start and I have never regretted it. Kit. I could talk about kit forever, the kit I use in training, the kit I use for recovery, I've got lots of videos and all that stuff already, so go check those out. But here I'm gonna talk about and focus on just three things that I altered after I started, so I could have done with knowing about in advance. Shoes are really particular, so this advice is not about a particular brand or particular model, but rather a style. I did my very first OCR in my park run shoes and quickly discovered that what was great on flat, dry grass was not very good gripping onto a rope or running over wet, muddy ground, tree roots and clambering over things. You need trail running shoes and finding the ones that work for you could be a bit of trial and error. If you ask a question online, you will get people who are just passionate about their particular shoe telling you that is the best thing ever, you need that. But if it's not right for you, it'll be horrible to run in. For example, after my first run, I switched over to Innovate shoes, which are great, awesome off-road grip. And they are very good shoes, I recommended them lots. But by the end of the year, my foot had got so wide from all the off-road running I was doing that there wasn't a model they made that my foot fit in. So now I run in Ultra shoes, in particular Lone Peaks normally. They are nice and roomy, but that's because I like a minimalist shoe, especially off-road. They have very little cushioning, there's zero drop between the front and the back of the shoe. I like the idea of having very little between my foot and the ground, it allows me to catch a rolling ankle much faster and just feel what is underfoot. At my size and weight, I have enough problems barreling through a forest as it is without being unsure what I'm standing on. So they work for me, but not everybody. Find what works for you. Oh, and here's a tip, gaiters. I discovered these halfway through my first season, but I will now always wear them. They're incredibly simple. They just keep stones and twigs and rubbish from going in your shoe. I'm amazed more people don't use them. You do not want to run a three hour event with a stone in your shoe. But they also keep your laces tied. Wet laces will flap about and come undone. And when you step in deep mud, as you often will, you can pull your foot out and have your shoe still stay attached. I've seen enough people running OCR events with one shoe to know that you do not want to lose a shoe in the mud. Carrying water is an interesting one. My very first race, I carried water because I always carried water when I went jogging normally. And this was back at a time when I thought I needed to just have water all the time with me. You can check out my video on that as to why you probably don't. Now, nobody else in that race had water with them. No one was wearing a pack. Half of them weren't even wearing shirts. I felt very over-equipped. So the next event, I didn't carry water and I fitted in much better. I really looked the part. And halfway around, I wish I'd had some water. So now I just carry it, unless it's a very short event. Most people don't, especially in the age group categories. And I don't care. I've run past and overtaken enough people who have had to stop at water stations. I've washed my hands with my own water supply when I've got muddy before I'm jumping on monkey bars and want a good grip. I've even got muck and stuff out of my eyes with my own water supply. If I finish an event with water that I didn't need, it's mildly annoying, pointless that I carried it. But being halfway around and wanting it and not having it, that is a bad day out. If you don't need it, fine. But if you're more comfortable running with water, just ignore the fact that you might be the odd one out. And as with shoes, test whatever you're gonna use. I used to use camelbacks all the time, and they're great for the mountain bike, but I found they bounced around too much on the runs. I now use a different model, doesn't bounce as much, holds enough water, I can chuck my gels in there as well if it's a long run. So test what you're gonna use. And the last one's a weird one, hand products. It's odd, but if you get it right, it will quite literally save you a huge amount of pain and discomfort, so worth covering. Now I've lifted weights for a long time and I always thought that having calloused hard hands from doing so was a sign of effort, it was almost something to be proud of. No, it's not. Having one part of your hand hard and raised and callous is asking to have it ripped off on a hanging event. If you Google obstacle course races calloused hand damage, the pictures are horrific. In fact, don't Google it, you'll have nightmares. 
You do want your hands to be tough, but you want the surface of your hand to be even. When one patch is harder and more raised than another, that's when things get ripped off. I bought a little device used for sanding down the hard skin on heels. In fact, based on the photographs on the advert for it, a common concern for ladies wearing open back stilettos apparently. And every evening, I'd spend a couple of seconds grinding down the hard skin, apply a little moisturizer, and that's it. I've never had a problem, despite being pretty heavy and on occasion spending a very long time hanging on things. Stopping and starting. The last one, something I was not prepared for when I began, was the mental toughness required to push yourself on these events. If you have ever run a long run, whatever that means for you, it could be 5K, 10K, marathon, ultra marathon, whatever you call long, when it gets really hard, your job is just keep doing what you're doing. And that might be tough, but it is what it is. Just keep going. What I found so different on an obstacle course race was the stop start nature. The constant varying of effort that's required. One minute you're jogging gently across a field and then stop, do an obstacle, get off the obstacle, start again. Maybe you come to a hill and you have to power walk up it and you get to the top and you have to start running again. And then you come to a downhill section, you need to change your pace again. At the bottom of the hill, another obstacle, stop and do that. It's constantly changing level of mental effort that's required to push yourself up the hills, to get up off the floor, to start running again when you've been walking. And the best way to practice it is practice it. When I go out and do long runs now, every kilometer I stop and I do something. It could be burpees, it could be press ups. If there's a play park there, I could be doing some chin ups or some grip work on the bars. Anything that requires me to break my rhythm, do something new and then tell myself, go again. Or instead of stopping, I might break into a 20 or 30 second hard, fast sprint and then come back to a jog again. I'll be gasping for breath. I want to stop and at least walk but I will keep running. It will just allow me to get used to that notion of telling myself, do not stop moving. Because there's no greater waste of time than not moving forwards when you could move forwards. Now clearly, if you need to stop and rest, obviously you stop and rest. But something that I noticed very early on when I was watching back videos of my first couple of runs was that I would come off of an obstacle that I had failed and I'd walk or I'd take a rest or I'd grab some water. Or if I had to do burpees for a failure, I'd get off of those and I'd just stand around just recovering, getting my breath back. And I'd watch obstacles where I smashed it, flew through them. Those times I'd get off the obstacle, I'd be straight into a hard ah! run, even if the obstacle had been more exhausting than the ones I'd failed, which told me 95% of it is in your head. So when running and training, practice stopping and starting. Get comfortable talking to yourself. I've gone up so many steep hills, just muttering over and over to myself, do not stop, do not stop, do not stop. Sound like a lunatic, but I'm a lunatic that is moving forwards. That is it. If you sort those six, you will be above average, at least with regards to your preparation and the results will hopefully follow. Useful? I hope so. Obstacle course racing is a staggering amount of fun. And if anything that I've gone over here makes it sound like it's all a bit more hardcore than you would like, don't be put off. You can run them at any pace you like. You can do as well or as badly on the obstacles as you care to. You could, if you want, ignore all my advice. You could run your first one as ill prepared as I was and you still have a great day out. Please like and subscribe. I film most of my races, so hit the notification button and you'll see when those pop up in the future. And if you see me on one, give me a wave. You might end up on YouTube. Unless you're overtaking me and gonna beat me, in which case I'll just edit you out. I'm kidding, I wouldn't do, I will do that. You will not be on my channel.